track on my radio got to number eight in 1979 the debut hit single for the selector and it is a pleasure to welcome lead singer pauline black hi there jackie hi nice to meet you nice to meet you too how's it going fine fine absolutely fine i'm in coventry uh, are you busy at the minute because of course you're promoting the new studio album from the selector right yeah we're promoting this and also uh dance craze the video of dance craze the movie so uh there's quite a bit going on around that as well so yeah and i mean and it's uh it's it's a real sort of look at the at the, at the whole two-tone era right yes it, it's live music all the bands all the bands um us uh specials uh madness uh, the body snap matches uh the beat and uh bad manners fantastic and and it, it, are you constantly gigging pauline are you sort of a gigging band ongoing i mean i know you spend some time in the states as well i think bands of our era uh i, I think we're called legacy or heritage or some some such nonsense like that sort of these days yeah um Yes, I mean, that is how we earn money. I mean, you know, you don't do it out of the goodness of your heart for the whole time, do you? You've got to be uh, earning some money. So our main way of earning money is uh, not through streaming songs. That's for young people, you know, um, and and all our audience and have a bit of difficulty sometimes with kind of streaming <laughs> services and all those sorts of things. So they like a bit of vinyl in their hands or they like a CD, something physical. Yeah. And and, and to come along to gigs and uh, have a night out. And um, that's what we do. They get a bit extra with us, of course, than just a night out. But uh, they get a bit of stuff to think about, too. <laughs> Let's go back a little bit in time then to, to, to the beginning of it all, if that's okay with you, Pauline. Um, sure. You've, you've long been closely associated with Coventry, but is that actually where you grew up? I actually grew up in Romford in Essex. I am an Essex girl. Ah. And, uh, and I spent the first um, 17 years of my life there. And then uh, just when I was 18, I came to Coventry to go to Lanchester Polytechnic, as it was then, but it's uh, to study sciences, and uh, but it's now called Coventry University. Do you have a memory of the first record that you that you bought for yourself with pocket money or anything? Yes, I, I do. The first record that I actually bought for myself was when I came to Coventry and I was in my first student year. And uh, funnily enough, it has nothing at all to do with ska music. It was a band called oh, Pentangle. Right. They're a bit folky. And uh, and it was Basket of Light, um, and uh, that was closely followed by uh, Blue by Joni Mitchell. I, I started off in folk clubs. Um, not a lot of people know that. <laughs> That's interesting. That is interesting. How did that happen? Uh, well, basically, um, we live near a pub where sometimes the Furies came to sing. Ah, okay. Uh, who are, uh, yeah, an Irish band, and uh, they would sing all kinds of rousing songs and things, and they used to have staybacks, uh, which basically meant that you could drink after, I don't know, two o'clock on a Sunday or something like that. But there was, it, this was in their back room. But then they always just opened up the floor to anyone who could either sing or play a guitar or whatever. Right. And I remember seeing a girl there do um a song i think it was donovan's yellow is the color of my true love's hair and i thought i could do that so i went home and i had a leonard Cohen songbook at home and i learned the guitar in a week and went down there and did bird on the wire and i never looked back after that like a bird on the wire. Bird on a Wire, written by Leonard Cohen. That version was a minor hit for the Neville Brothers in 1990. I remember playing it on the wireless back then, actually. Uh, and it was the song that got Pauline Black of the Selector up on stage at a folk club performing for the very first time in her life. I mean, how amazing. <laughs> Were people yeah. around you sort of gobsmacked that you were doing that? Or did they know that you, that you sort of harboured those sort of... No, I didn't harbour anything at all. I mean, I, I, I certainly wasn't thinking of singing. It was just we were involved in this social group that did that. Yeah. My husband just happened to have a guitar lying around that he said he was going to practice, never did, so I just took it. But people know that I'm pretty willful and, um, you know, 
sort of if I get the bit between my teeth about something, I'll see it through to the end. Yeah. So how did your musical tastes develop on then from the local folk clubs? What were you listening to and how were you um, expanding your artistic horizons? Well, on pirate radio stations, of <laughs> which there were many in those days, like Luxembourg and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the ones out in the channel that they used to be, Radio oh, Caroline, yes. Radio Caroline, things like that. Then people of my generation probably listened to anything that was Tamla, anything that was Soul, uh, and, um, you know, things like Bob Dylan was around at that time, uh, Julie Felix, uh, all those kinds. And then, of course, you got the Cilla Black, and the whole of the Liverpool sound and the Beatles and Rolling Stones. I was always a Rolling Stones person, not a Beatles person. Um, <laughs> and, oh, I did fancy Nick Jagger. I thought he was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, 1966, Paint It Black, The Rolling Stones. Tonight's guest, Pauline Black of The Selector, crushing hard back in the day on Mick Jagger. And we will be back with more musical memories and great conversation with the first lady of British two-tone, Pauline Black, next. Welcome back to the evening show with Jackie Brambles. It's just you, me, and tonight's special guest, Pauline Black of The Selector, cozying on in for a great conversation and a wonderful meander through her musical memories between now and nine. Um, so, Pauline, before the break, we heard that rather unusually for somebody who went on to become a two-tone superstar, your musical education initially were, you know, was in the folk clubs of Essex, where you also performed for the very first time. Uh, then listening to pirate radio, your musical tastes started to expand. So how did how did the band come together, Selector? How did that all form? Where was when did the interest in ska music sort of start to to show itself? Well, the Selector started off with um, the lead guitarist who was uh, was the Selector basically, um, and he'd written a song called Kingston Affair, and he recorded that in 1977. Um, but it just kind of stuck on the shelf. No one was interested in it particularly. But anyway, meanwhile, Jerry Dammers of uh, Specials fame yep. uh, and the founder of it and Two Tone, uh, they'd recorded Gangsters, but they didn't have enough money to do a B-side. So they asked Neil Davis whether he would like to put his instrumental, which had been lying on the shelf for two years, yeah. uh, rename it The Selector, which they did, and out it went. <laughs> Everybody knows that Gangsters became a hit. It was a double A side. And uh, John Peel thought that because it was a double A side, that uh, on the other side, the selector was obviously a special song. Um, so Neil had to ring up the radio station and put him right on Oh, this. my goodness. And from, I know, from that, uh, sort of side by side with that, I was... Um, deciding to form a, a, a reggae band and be the singer with some others. And along to one of our rehearsals came Limville Golding, who was the rhythm guitarist in the specials. And he said, you, you and you, which was, I think, three of us at the time, um, uh, you should come along and meet this guy called Neil Davis, which we did. And that very evening, basically, um, the the selector was formed. How amazing. Yeah, it was a bit, it was a bit amazing, I have to say. I mean, it was all very quick and, uh, you know, and within a couple of weeks, we were supporting the specials on tour, doing all the sort of, you know, little clubs and things like that, the F Club in Leeds and the Limit Club in Sheffield and and, and, and all of those kinds of things. And did you take to that straight away, Pauline, or, or was it kind of, what you know, was your head exploding that suddenly you were on, to, on a proper tour? No, it never exploded in that way. It was just like, you know, they were all stepping stones and, hey, this is good and look at this Costello is it one of our gigs and you know and so it was just like that Elvis Costello with Pump It Up a hit from 1978 and soon after that he was a big fan of the selector who had their first hit the following year 
And Pauline, you seem to have taken that very much in your stride. Basically, it was just the, the normal kind of state of things that you were in a band, a load of other blokes sort of acting up for most of the time. So um, being the good girl that I am, I observed. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and the next thing we knew, we were on the two-tone tour, which was basically like a school outing, but uh, with 21 other blokes, you know, who were in the madness or um, the, the specials or the selector. And it was great fun. And, and, and presumably you were one of very few females on that tour. I was the only female apart from our manager or manageress, as we like to call her, who is uh, Juliet V, and she's now married to Billy Bragg. <laughs> so oh, right, all, right. All very incestuous. All, all very incestuous. <laughs> 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 and, and how long did it take before, you know, you found yourself... You know, breaking really breaking through, and you're suddenly you're at top of the pops. Uh, well, that took about mm, six months, I guess. Um, we were again, which is incredible to have it that happened that quickly. But it was extraordinary times. I mean, it's um, Jerry Dammers had managed to get a deal with Chrysalis Record Company to put out his two tone label, and in that deal um, was included the fact that he could spend a thousand pounds or give a thousand pounds to a band of his choice to record a single. Um, and we were the recipients of that. Wow. Um, so uh, us and Madness and The Beat um, and The Body Snatchers as well. And of course that then turned into a movement. We all had singles out. And I mean, I think there was one top of the pops where all three bands, um, Special with Madness and Selector, all had tracks, um, you know, in the top 10. It's like a, it's like a Hollywood film that you wouldn't believe. Well, it wasn't quite a star is born. But, <laughs> it, 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 it was but you like know what that. I mean? Like you're all mates together. You're all mates together, and then you're on the tour together, and then somebody gets given the thousand pounds, and you're all on having a record together, and then you're all on top of the pops together. I mean, it's all just yeah, it was pretty strange. And then the next minute, you're all in America together, and. And, um, but, you, you know, you've got to think about the, the, the time that it was. It was post-punk. And, of course, you've got The Clash, who were hugely famous at that time. Joe Strummer was. And they kind of straddled punk and um, kind of reggae. Yeah. Um, and the specials had been out on tour with The Clash before we did the two-tone tour. Um, and uh, obviously that had caused them to think, hey, we can't be doing reggae, but hey, let's have a look at ska music. That was a faster form. This is a much more, you know, interesting form of dance music to pair, say, with punk and um, and a bit of soul and a bit of rock and all the things that we did pair it with, but, you know, make this wonderful fusion, which was basically two-tone. <laughs> Rock the Casbah from The Clash, that version featuring the late, great ranking Roger of The Beat, uh, beautifully showcasing that crossover of punk and ska, as Pauline talked about. And we will be back with more great conversation from tonight's special guest, Pauline Black of The Selector, next. Welcome back to The Evening Show with Jackie Brambles. Uh, welcome back to our great conversation where tonight's top-notch chinwaggery is coming from our special guest, Pauline Black of The Selector. Um, so before the break, Pauline, we heard about getting that big break into the UK charts, going on the two-tone tour. And then, of course, the next stop was heading to America. What was the experience like going to the States? Um, did they? Were you sort of going to a, a, a fan base that was already very familiar with two-tone, with ska music, or, or were you sort of taking them by, by surprise? Well, it was a baptism of fire, really. The specials had already been out there, and we closely followed on behind. And it's like all things with America. If you're on the East Coast or you're on the West Coast, namely, basically, Los Angeles and San Francisco on the West and and um, New York on the East, yeah. you're great. I mean, there's huge numbers of fans, and they all roll out and all the rest. But there's that huge yawning bit in the middle that sort of dust bowl. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And particularly when you get further south. And we were a predominantly black band at that time. We had um, six uh, black members and one white member and a uh, young white blonde manageress. And if we were in the south, say in Texas in those days or somewhere like that, and we went into a truck stop place, you know, for some tea, not that they do tea that well, but, you know, to eat something. Yeah, yeah. You could stop the place dead. 
everybody had stopped talking. You'd all sit down and you wouldn't get served. And uh, and after 15 minutes, it was quite obvious what was going on. And you'd get up and you'd go. How insane and how scary. Oh, this was 1979. I mean, what, 10 years after um, civil rights? So, uh, you know, prior to that, you weren't even allowed to sit at the lunch counter. So we could count ourselves relatively lucky, I think. <laughs> I mean, talk, talk about the highs and lows, to be sort of, you said, to be celebrated on either coast. Did you have any of those, you know, lovely rock and roll pop superstardom moments where you either met a musical hero or you found yourself in a place where you thought, I can't believe this is happening to me. Is this the dream? Um, yes. In New York, um, Mick Jagger actually came along to the gig. Oh, wow. Played. I know, but I had a headache that night. I didn't know <laughs> he was there. And I repaired to the bus and I kicked myself ever since because I was just uh -oh. so, so, so annoyed. Um, but, uh, and, and come Conversely, when we were on the West Coast, we met the incredible Marsha Hunt. Oh, wow. Um, who was in hair and, you know, the whole reason I got an afro in the 70s. Yes, of course. And, uh, and of course, she had a child at that time for Karis Jagger, um, for Mick. So, uh, and she took to us like, um, oh, it, you know, how wonderful you are and uh, and all the rest of it and invited us around her house. And, oh, wow. and I just couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, like, I don't know how many years before, sort of eight years before she'd been my heroine on my books at school and things like those pictures so so yeah that, that was and you'd cool. had and you'd had a bit of a yen for her for her other half for old mick and then there you are well yeah well there you see i mean i was really jealous <laughs> <laughs> and she'd got the proof how amazing <laughs> so so I, I i hadn't but also bet midler turned up oh wow I mean, you'd have thought she was a bag lady at the time. It was before she hit really, really. Yeah, when she was sort of playing the bathhouses and things like that. Uh, yeah, that's that's entirely right. And um, she came along to the Whiskey A Go Go, um, which is on the strip in in, in LA. And uh, she came backstage afterwards, and she came up to me and she said, "How do you jump around so much with your?" <laughs> <laughs> if I can say that, she was reasonably well endowed as well. <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> oh, that's a very Bette Midler thing to say. Very yeah, it's Bette exactly Midler, what yeah. <laughs> Some say love, it is a... When the night has been too... The Rose, the theme from the movie of the same name, which would have put Bette on the map in 1980 massively. And that was uh, not long after meeting Pauline Black, our special guest tonight. What about a standout gig for you? Is there a, a particular one either of your own or where you were, you know, on the bill with many other people that, that is a standout memory for, for, for good, for bad, for, for whatever? I think a standout gig um, was probably, I went out in 2018 to South America with Gorillas because Damon Alban had invited me to... Um, decide whether I'd like to put some lyrics to a track that he had, which I did. It was called Charger. Right. And uh, Grace Jones ended up on, it was the Humans with a Z ah. album. And uh, she ended up on the main uh, album singing it. And um, and I ended up on the super deluxe vinyl, <laughs> and uh, and it was great fun. It was great fun. But I uh, flew out to Mexico City because that's where their first show was, and I'd just done a show. I think it was St Patrick's Day in Dublin. So you can imagine what that was like. <laughs> and I came off stage, and I had to go straight to the airport. And many changes later. Um, and hours later, I ended up in Mexico City to get in a taxi to go to the venue. Oh, wow. And I'd never even played with these people before. <gasps> um, and, and do this song. <laughs> and uh, the first thing that happened was, um, because I, without my glasses, I'm very short, so I, I can't see where the hell I'm going. Right. I'm a, and it was 80,000 people's stadium as well. I walked out on stage and I tripped over a very tiny little riser oh. and went splat on my face in front of Damon, who howled with laughter. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and then the next minute I picked myself up and the song started and I just had to get into uh. it. And, uh, he is a very, what's the word, forceful performer. I mean, he will be like two inches away from your nose singing. Wow. So you have to give as good as you get. Yeah. So, uh, 
that was the most memorable time. I mean, if you can prat fall in front of 80,000 people, people, you can do anything. And then get, <laughs> get straight back up and... and get straight back <laughs> up, yeah, yeah. It's a bit like Chumba Wumba. <laughs> what, what's it like hearing, you know, when you somebody else like a Grace Jones interpreting things her way that you've written what is that is it is it, is it a joyful or is it have you have you have to sort of a, feel possessive about it no not at all i mean she did what she does you know owns it <laughs> she owns everything kind of thing it's um so no i mean you know what could be better up to the bumper number 12 in 1986 for grace jones well listen before we let you go um I, we always ask our, our guests to pick our final track um it's not daft enough question to ask you what's your favorite song um but it is a, a particular song that you find yourself revisiting often because you know it will deliver what you're looking for which is either to be comforted if you're feeling melancholy or inspired or energized it's a track that i heard and i think if if I'm really being honest, it was the thing that spurred me on to think that I could make some music and I could maybe play guitar, obviously not as well as this person. Um, but it was in just before I got started and it was Joan Armour Trading's uh, Love and Affection, which I just think is the most delightful and uh, track ever, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. What a great track. I am not in love. Love and Affection, a top 10 hit for Joan Armour Trading in 1976. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have this chat with you, Pauline. Um, we want to tell people that the new album is, is, is it currently out or is it just coming out? It's coming out on the 21st of April, but the single is out and it's called Human Algebra. I love that. And you're going to be doing some dates soon? Yeah, we're anywhere and everywhere and in Paris and in Amsterdam and, and all, all places in between. And we end up here in Coventry, uh, our hometown, uh, in May 14th or 12th or so, 12th, I think, 12th of May. Yeah. Well, listen, have a blast on tour. All the best with the new album. And thanks again for your time, Pauline. Been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for asking. Thank you. Cheers now. Bye-bye. Pauline Black of The Selector, another fascinating story, another great conversation with some fantastic musical memories too.